Somewhere in an anonymous business park in the south of England is a very, very special place. Arguably the single most important room in the country. The people here are fine-tuning Britain's power grid. It's a complex dance, conducting a fluctuating energy mix from power stations around the nation. And now they're confronting their greatest challenge yet, how to prepare for an energy revolution, to build the pylons and transformers and infrastructure we need, to get the metals and materials, even as everyone else races for them, all without the lights going out. This is the biggest untold story of the modern era, of how we reshape our power grid, but it begins somewhere unexpected. Here, in the layers of stone beneath the soil of southwest England, is a very unusual mineral. This is ball clay. It's unlike anything I've ever stepped on before, actually. It's kind of, it's, it's slidey, but you're, you're, you're kind of sticking. It's always sticky as well, like glue. Yeah, so this stickiness is actually a, a benefit. It's one of its key properties. While most of this stuff goes into ceramics and sanitary wear, it's also critical for something else. Electrical porcelain, which is what you use to make the insulation bits of the grid, the brown parts here. They're really important. When you're sat in your home and, and any electrical item that you use, whether you boil a kettle or you turn your TV on, requires the ball clay here to be able to transmit that electricity to and you. Probably, and actually that goes around the world, does it? Probably in, in networks in India and China, they're all reliant on UK ball clay as well. Absolutely. It's extraordinary. What you're seeing here is the very beginning of a supply chain to construct the future. Because expanding the grid is one of the biggest building projects in modern history. And to make pylons, transformers and so on, you don't just need copper and aluminium and steel, but also obscure stuff like this clay. And the UK has an unexpected part to play here, because everyone else wants our clay for their grids. British Minerals about to begin their journey around the world to play their small but crucial role in solving the puzzle of climate change. For years, electricity grids have been the unfashionable end of green energy, the bit we need to sort out but no one spends much time thinking about. But now, it seems they're finally on the political radar. We're going to have to quadruple the amount of electricity we generate between now and 2050. We need four times more electricity than we're generating today. And so this is a massive pressure on the current grid, which was never built for anything like that. We're in a situation where if you want a grid connection, you're told, we'll put you in the queue. You might get one at the end of the 2030s. That is not good enough when we've got bills still close to record highs. It's not just that we need more power lines to accommodate all those electric cars and heat pumps. We also need more cables, more transformers, more substations and infrastructure, both for us and for all those new green power installations. It's a huge infrastructure investment programme. There's no point in building out large offshore wind farms all around the coast if you actually can't get the power out of those wind farms and get it to where it's needed, to where people are living, to where factories have located, to where uh, industry is. But this building project, it won't be simple. T the pylon company, please don't build the pylons. Imagine if there were pylons in your garden and you had kids and you had to move house and you would feel really sad. I would be really sad to leave my home. And East Anglia is at the front line of a new battle. National Grid want to build an electricity highway through these fields, connecting the wind turbines of the North Sea to London. Those living here are fighting back. Where exactly would it be in this field? One of the pylons will be just approximately here. I've wrote that, so we would be so almost... More or less underneath it. Because of the, the small size of this field, mm. it means that we'll be limited as to what we can grow on it. There's also there's health dangers and risks to people living and, and working near uh, this very high voltage electricity. How determined are you to kind of try and fight this? Very, and I'm not the only one. It ha I mean, it, people have started to 
talk in terms of why don't we march on London? Across the road from James's farm, another resident fiercely opposed to living under the shadow of pylon expansion. This was supposed to be Jenna's forever home, but she'll move if the pylons go ahead. Has it been stressful to start yeah. going through this? Yeah, definitely. It's, uh, you know, weighed on my mind a lot, you know, and come into that decision that we would sell if they go ahead, you know. So, yeah, big implications. One of the things that they're, they're talking about is potentially that, that people who live who live near pylons are going to get compensation for it. Would that, would that make up for it? No, no, I think it's just insulting. What the, the, a couple of the things they've suggested are just, yeah, really? totally insulting. And why would we accept that over losing our beautiful countryside? I'm worried about the animals and the plants and the trees. What are the animals around here that you're most concerned about? The bats, because they, and the birds. But this is only one small part of what needs to be built out. Because it's not just new pylons we need, but a whole new system. Once upon a time, this control room only had to orchestrate a finite number of big coal and gas power stations. Now it's having to contend with thousands of wind turbines and, more recently, hundreds of battery plants around the country. And parks like this are part of how you can keep the lights on without having to burn fossil fuels. The theory is they charge when the sun's shining and the wind's blowing, and there's more power than we need. And then they send power back into the grid when we need it. On the external display here, um, we can see currently the system voltage, so the DC voltage of the batteries is 1,390 volts thereabouts. But right now it's, it's charging in anticipation of the, you know, the next moment, it could be what well, it could be later on this evening. Yeah, in, in a lot of cases, it'll either charge slowly throughout the evening, um, ready for the morning, kind of six, seven o'clock early rush. But in practice, it's not so simple. At the moment, unfortunately, um, at this point in time, uh, they, they are not able to use batteries actively to the, in, to the extent that they should be. To so what extent? Um, upwards of 80% of the time. So 80% of the time that they could yeah. be being used, they are not being used? At this moment in time, yeah. Green power storage. That's right. And so what's being used instead? Uh, unfortunately, it's uh, gas-fired generation is being used instead. So the grid is literally firing up gas-fired power stations instead of using this clean storage you've got here? It's worse, unfortunately. It, it means that if they've got to fire up gas to provide that flexibility, they've also got to push something else off, and it's invariably wind generation. According to calculations carried out for Sky by Modo Energy, a data platform, the National Grid's controller's decision to skip available battery storage and fire up gas power stations created 71,000 tonnes of carbon emissions in the year to October alone, equivalent to the annual emissions of 44,000 petrol cars. So there's been a dramatic increase in the amount of batteries that we, that we have on the system, and we're talking about you know the systems moving from uh, optimizing maybe one, two hundred uh, generators out there to literally thousands. So we're changing a how that those systems optimize. You are working on that right now. We are working on that. But is it fair to say that at the moment, perhaps you are using gas more than you should be using it? No, I think you've got to remember that the control room are optimizing not just for the next megawatt of generation. So it may be the case that that gas-fired generating station has been used because we need inertia on the system as well. At this stage, you're probably wondering, what is this inertia thing he's talking about? The short answer is, it's the magic ingredient that helps keep the grid alive. And right now, we get most of that inertia from turbines turning in conventional power stations. The National Grid isn't just a collection of pylons and transformers. It is also a set of power stations with big turbines running round all of them at the same frequency, 50 hertz, all around the country. It is the rhythm of our power system, and that rhythm really matters. And the thing is, wind turbines and solar panels don't provide inertia. So if we're really serious about cutting the cord with fossil fuels, we need some way of getting this magic ingredient. And that's what this 40-ton flywheel in a building in Liverpool is doing, turning at 1,500 RPM not to provide power, but the inertia that helps keep the grid stable. But even this isn't going to be enough, because in future, on those days when we can't generate enough power in this country, we might have to get it from elsewhere. But where?
2,000 miles away. Under the heat of the North African sun, might Morocco have the answer? This is Nur, the world's largest concentrated solar power plant, where the Atlas Mountains meet the Sahara Desert. The total area of the complex is about 3,000, exactly 3,042 hectares. It's more or less the area, uh, the urban area of our capital Rabat. So you can so imagine this how This is the size of your capital city, all, yeah, and quite. all solar panels. Yes, quite. And there are plans afoot to bring Moroccan power all the way to Britain. We have a grid which is connected to the European one via Spain. We can also, why not, exchange with, with Europe. And also it can, give, uh, it can give the possibility for other countries like the United Kingdom, let's say, <laughs> uh, to install uh, important plants uh, like in the sou uh, south of Morocco. So we, so, so we in the UK could be getting Moroccan sun-produced electricity in a few years' time. Yes, sir. And in this part of the plant, they don't just collect solar energy, but store it in molten salt. Perhaps you see where we're heading here. Not just a national grid, but an international grid. That's the theory, at least. But there's a bit of a plot twist here, which is that actually for most of the time that we were here, the tower looked like that. It didn't glow bright with all the solar rays being bounced off the mirrors because the sun wasn't shining. It was cloudy and it was cloudy for longer than the period that this place can store that energy, rather underlining a point, that there are, even in the most dependable areas, still some question marks about whether you can rely on them all the time. Maybe the lesson is what we need is not one single source of power, but loads of them, which implies an ever more complex grid. And it's hard to see how you can do that without many more pylons. Which brings us back to the real front line in the energy transition between the planners and the residents who don't want those lines in their fields. Saying yes to an offshore grid, lobbying uh, our esteemed MPs and government. The reasons are many. The eyesore, the impact on nature, not to mention house prices. Absolute devastation to the values of people's properties. Frustration with the plan. A lack of strategy for the electricity grid. Anger at the messaging. They've got absolutely no understanding at all about what goes on in the countryside. And don't whatever you do mention the word NIMBY. The people here say they're not against power lines per se, but they just want them rooted under the sea instead. The easiest way to dismiss um, our campaign is they're just NIMBYs, they're just against the pylons. We're proposing an alternative which has not been properly evaluated and not been given a chance. Um, a proper offshore grid would be much more efficient in the longer term. National Grid insists it'll be more expensive, so higher bills. But frankly, it still has yet to do the proper work. And that work will take time. And, says the Chancellor, we're running out of time. What we're going to do is dramatically reduce the time it takes for things to get through the planning system. And also, total transparency over the compensation. We've said there'll be about £10,000 compensation. They say that's an insult. Everyone we spoke to, literally everyone we said, well, said it was an insult. Um, they are able to object. What I would say is, if we don't do this, then as a country we will have much higher uh, energy bills in the future and much more volatile energy bills. Will those arguments sway those who say they'll do anything to fight these plans? Will government ride roughshod over those who want them to think twice? Like everything else in the energy transition, the race to rebuild the grid is far more complex than you might have thought. Mm -hmm.